Good morning, everybody. I'm going to call this meeting of state government finance and elections to order. Um, today is, is uh, um, March 17th, or excuse me, March 18th, um, 2022. Pursuant to House Rule 10.01, this meeting is being held virtually. Um, the first order of business is for the committee administrator to call the roll. Thank you. Chair Nelson. Present. Nelson is present. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson's present. Carlson is present. Representative Nash. Present. Nash is present. Representative Bonner. Bonner is present. Representative Joskowski. Present. Joskowski is present. Representative Elkins. Elkins is present. Elkins is present. Representative Greenman. Present. Greenman is present. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn present. Cleborn is present. Representative Kosnick. Kosnick present. Kosnick is present. Representative Mason. Mason present. Mason is present. Representative New Brindley. Present. New Brindley is present. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski present. Pulowski is present. Representative Quam. Present. Quorum is present. Chair, with that, uh, we have a quorum. We have a quorum. Um, the next order of business is approval of the minutes from March 17th, 2022. Uh, Representative Carlson, you want to get a chance to look at the minutes? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I move the minutes from March 17th. Representative Carlson's moved approval of the minutes to March 17th, 2022. Um, everybody want to Members on on my on mute and all in favor of approval of the minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed. The minutes are approved. All members with the uh, the first bill we got on the order is House File forty one twenty one, and this is the governor's uh, budget items um, and uh, supplemental budget. And I'm going to hand the chair over to Representative uh, Vice Chair Carlson. And I'm going to walk through the bill. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Uh, and thank you all for all the testifiers that are here today. Uh, let's get going on this. So Chair Nelson, why don't you, uh, would you like to move House File 4125? I'll move House File 4125. And the intent this, this morning is after we walk through just to lay this over. Um, there is an amendment that has been, that hasn't been posted yet, but we're not going to act on it, but I'll, I'll talk about it. Uh, basically, dealing with the graves and um, and uh, Native American graves portion of that, and that's been worked out. My, my understanding is with the administration and uh, the Native American councils. Um, but first part of the bill is the appropriations, and as we walk through this, um, we put on the list as the, as it's listed in the bill. First, we have the Attorney General's office. And part of the, am the amendment that's, that uh, I oh, talked about was on line two, page five, the, the uh, um, thing for the appropriations for 2022, uh, $3.1 $3 million for the Attorney General's office um, is being deleted. But as part of that is that uh, the, the Attorney General also is asking for more money next year and more money in the tails. And what that money for is, my note here that I have um, has to do with uh, um, trying to enhance, you know, out uh, outstate. Okay, here it is. It's hiding on me. Anyway, it's, it's the supplemental budget request for the AG's office has two elements. As I said, this one is they're giving they're lowering the amount for this year that by three million, but it's also the, the ongoing money is about retention of, of employees, retention of attorneys, retention of attorneys so that they have the right size, um, right size talent in the building and, and the right, right size of the administrative staff. Um, they're also asking for, like they did last year, which that we couldn't get the Senate last year to agree to, but is a, a enhanced criminal prosecution for the outstate, um, is mostly for the outstate. When counties need additional help, they'll con come to the attorney general's office. And again, mm -hmm. the majority of that is out, those outstate help, where some of the smaller counties don't have large staff, so when they get a huge case, 
either murder or rape or something that's beyond their capability to handle, they ask, they call in the attorney general's office for help. And that's, that's, that's his office there. And that's what he's asking for going forward. Um, then in the secretary of state's office, and this was something he asked for last year, they're asking for additional money for a chief information office officer to deal with their IT stuff. Um, they're also asking for, again, this is something that was in last year's budget, civic engagement and youth outreach. And then there's also the, uh, $200 million that's in the budget for um, matching the, 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 the new HABA funds that was just passed by the federal government. I believe I got that number right, 200 million, it might be 200. Anyway, next we have the Minnesota IT technology, um, their cyber grant program. They're asking for um, uh, 1.7 and, and for this year, they're asking for money for the, for the federal, to offset the federal revenue. Um, they're asking for money to advance in the application accessibility, enterprise college transformation, targeted moder application modernizations across the, uh, across the state, uh, accessibility technology that they're, they're looking to improve, some um, advanced cybersecurity tools that uh, they're, we're having with, with what's going on in, the, in Europe and what's going around the world. There's been a big increase in, the, in cybersecurity threats. And they're looking to, uh, to add some money to that. And that one is $9 million for this year. Nine million dollars, or this year's this uh, for 22-23 budget, nine million dollars for the 24-25 budget, and then three million dollars going forward from there. And I might have stated that wrong. I think it's it's nine million for the 24, and then three million for 25, and, and then ongoing to get to keep up with the security threats. Um, Ampers, our department administration is asking money for Ampers Community Radio. They are looking for a program they, try, they, they beta tested last year, dealing with minority um, BIPOC groups, having reports for them that by them, you know, by the groups, instead of ha having stuff just translated into the groups, they're having, they, they tried this thing where they have people from the community actually do the reports and they've got good results and good feedback from that from the communities around the state. And so they're looking to enhance that and so that's, an increase for that's a one-time admin, uh, one-time, one-time fund or uh, funding ask for them. Um, they're also looking for again the, the administration, the loss for the fleet fund, where um, the administration is asking for where because of COVID, uh, the hit, they haven't been getting as much money coming for that, but so they're asking for money to backfill that. Um, straight state procurement and then again in, innovation and participate state procurement innovation participation, which is easy for me to say. <sighs> um, money for improving state grants and oversight, eliminating um, meeting law, open open meeting law fees. Getting it down, the, back down this, also there's money they're asking for, for field archeology span with private cemeteries. And as I mentioned, the amendment that we have that we didn't post, but we're gonna be adding at a point Later on, has to has to do with a big piece of that that was worked out with the administration language there to deal with some issues that have between the tribes and and and, uh, and, and private cemeteries, but and, and and human remains found in tribal and not other areas throughout the state. But they've worked that out with the tribes, and uh, that's that'll be in the in the amendment we've got going forward. Um, <clears throat> Money for the COVID workers and, and the members. If you look at the overall budget request, if you look through this, the biggest piece of it is the is the some of the COVID backfill stuff, some of the COVID stuff that was done. Um, but if there's money here, they're asking for, for COVID relief on part of that's um, for worker part of that's for workers comp is that with the COVID presumption for our police officers and our firefighters that there's a cost to workers comp that they're, that they're trying to that they're trying to put in there and that's because of something we passed earlier this year getting down the management and budget there's there's money across the board for stabilizing the state's erp systems um, cross agency coordinations probably having to do with the children's cabinet and trying to get all that so that they're talking back and forth to one another 
capital budget outreach and assistance earned and safe earned sick and safe time another request for that evaluating the impact of state investments is another another that are asking for any money for going forward um department of revenue is just general governor's tax bill administration of that uh, legal money that they're setting aside for legalizing adult use cannabis that some changes are going to have to be done there and then frontline workers pay that that the governor has and we're trying to get past and we've promise to these workers that we need to get that passed. On um, the historical society, there's an, an operating adjustment, and then there's asking for money to support the reopening of the MHS, the uh, Minnesota Department of, or the Minnesota Historical Society sites around the state that have been closed because of the pandemic, costs related to reopening those things. Um, veterans bonus, veterans affairs, and again, we're gonna, we're, there's people here, we ask answer questions and we get done walking through this. Veterans Affairs, there's the uh, service bonus money for post 9-11 veterans. There's state grants for veterans service organizations. There's money for the uh, Fargo VA sent medical center construction. There's money for the uh, county veteran service agents, officers. Um, supports for landlords and, and, uh, and tenant supports from and, and, uh, and landlord engagement. Uh, lower the barriers for permanent supportive housing. And uh, engagement and outreach, and outreach activities are the things that are in the Veterans Affairs portion of the budget. Military's affairs, they're looking to um, deal with holistic health and fitness programs. This is something the, the, you, the, the National Army is doing and, and it's been working well to keep, keep soldiers in the field. It's something the, uh, the uh, Veterans Affairs or the military, military Affairs wants to institute here with the National Guard. Yeah, uh, enlistment and re-enlistment bonuses. This is something new. It was a bill that was heard last week in Veterans Affairs and um, enlistments. And we'll, we'll get into that later, but it's, it's, it's basically allowing our list of, uh, of bonuses for re-enlistment. It used to be when people got after after 12 years that that those went away in the National Guard because they figured the people would stay in for 20 years once they got to 12. Um, they've removed some of that stuff with the uh, federal pensions. And so now they're looking to attempt to keep people in, uh, in, the, um, in the National Guard. Once they've been there 12 years, they've got skills that they want to retain. Um, and the Board of Accountancy, they're asking for licensing enforcement and program supports. MMB, their non-operating budgets. It's uh, revised, and again, this is uh, um, just general transfers in and transfers out. A whole slew of things here that they're just trying to do that it's part of normal operating budgets. Um, again, then there's cola or adjust, you know, cola adjustments for retirees as, as part of this as part of this bill. And then again, the biggest thing, the biggest part of this whole budget that the governor's requesting has to do with COVID, the COVID emergency response, and that's $358 million. Um, if you strip that out, it's like I, my quick adding up of it as we're talking. Other than that, it's it's about a 40 to 40 to 60 million dollar budget request that the governor has. Like I said, the biggest piece of this this budget request is the COVID re emergency response issues. And so um, with that and then with that members, I'll turn it over for questions and uh, um, the I think these different parts here people in the department's can ask answer questions. All right, uh, thank you, Chair Nelson. And uh, for for those that are watching, um, uh, Chair Nelson ran through that. Uh, there's a lot to digest, uh, but I would also direct folks that uh, House Research, their summary uh, on the governor's uh, supplemental budget can be found on uh, the House of Representatives website as well. So uh, there's a written summary uh, with what uh, Chair Nelson just ran through uh, online. So you can view that as well. Uh, Chair Nelson, it looks like uh, we have uh, Commissioner Roberts Davis to testify. Do you want to go to testifiers next before yeah, questions? Before testifiers, or I, I think on the spreadsheet or on the list here talks, Mr. Roberts explained the, the, the spreadsheet on this and the file. Um, Go to her first, and then we can go to the testifiers. All right, one second. Uh, Representative Nash, I see you uh, have raised your hand. Uh, question for the chair, or uh, uh, yes, yeah, just to just to set the parameters for our discussion. Representative Nash. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Chair Nelson, two questions. One, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there is a frontline worker pay bill that's moving through the process. So I'm just curious as to why you've included that in this bill. And then I have another question as well. Chair Nelson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Nash, uh, the reason that's in here is, is basically is we, we have to fund it. So that's what it's in here for the, the bill going through. And it's part of the governor's budget. Uh, if it, that gets passed separately, that would be removed from this budget. Representative Nash. And Mr. Chair, I believe that that is passed off the House floor already, correct? Correct. Okay. And then my second question for Chair Nelson. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could. Uh, please proceed, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I always like to go through the chair. Um, chair Nelson, it, and last year was a bit of a jumble, I'm sure, for all of us, but um, I was on the conference committee with you um, to fund state government. Our, we, we passed that bill and it became law, right, to fully fund state government? Uh, chair Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Ch Mr. Chair and Representative Nash. We funded government at the agreed upon level with the uh, the Senate. Um, there are things that we we didn't do. There are things that um, we didn't do and that we held back on because of uncertainty about what was going to happen with COVID and what was going to happen with the economy and our state finances. Um, at one point there was talk that everything was going to be, that we were going to be in a huge deficit. That didn't transpire. We ended up having a, a uh, a sizable surplus and so some of these things that again that are going back some of these things that are from the different agencies and different departments um, are asking for is the stuff that they would ask for last year if they hadn't been asked by the governor to tamp down their request because they weren't sure what the, what the outlook of the economy was going to be and so they're trying they're here they're trying to make sure that our government lunch is right sized and functions properly okay uh, thank you chair nelson uh Representative Nash, I, I see you still have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just be very brief. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to set the parameters for conversation today for those that might be watching from home or elsewhere that we did indeed fund state government and the, those that were in charge of or are charged with operating their various departments uh, received their appropriation. And just, again, wanted to make sure that we went on record as saying state government has been fully funded. Um, and I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a quick question before we move on to the testifiers. Um, Chair Nelson, can you just point me to the lines in the bill language that are funding the COVID prov provisions? I'm not seeing those in the bill language. Chair Nelson. Uh, what provisions are you? The COVID, the COVID appropriations. You, you, I think you said that one was significantly higher um, and, and along with the frontline worker. I don't see those. Mr. Chair, I do, I, I, that's, sure. that's why I was saying we go to help Ms. Roberts to go through the okay. spreadsheet. I believe that's on the spreadsheet. Um, and I look through yeah. here real quick. I think Ms. Roberts can help us that. I, I, I would agree. Uh, Representative New Brindley, uh, if we went thank to uh, the commissioner to walk through, I think we could get to that. But do you had a follow up question? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And and certainly I, I I see things on the spreadsheet that I just don't see in the bill language. OK, so I'm wondering where they are in the actual bill. And and I'm assuming they're there and maybe I'm just not finding them. Quickly, yeah. But so I, I'm just wondering where they are in the actual bill. Right. Language. It, it is a quite a bit to digest. So I, I think just knowing that uh, that question has been raised, uh, let's turn it over to uh, Commissioner Roberts Davis and- uh, No, no, Mr. Chair, Helen Roberts are-, are Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, do we wanna Absolutely. have uh, Helen address that now? Have her walk um, through the Ms. Okay, Ms. Roberts, yes, Ms. Roberts, you're gonna walk us through the spreadsheet. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I'm Helen Roberts from the House Fiscal Staff. And the spreadsheet that you have posted reflects not only the governor's original recommendations that um, this committee heard at the end of February, but also includes the um, revisions that were released yesterday. So the language of the bill does not necessarily include all of the, or does not include the revisions that were released yesterday. 
Um, since the chair has walked through the bill already, I won't go line by line from the spreadsheet, but I can point out, um, for example, under the attorney general, you'll see that line number has a green shade to it. That means that that is a revision from the original governor's recs. And it reflects that the fiscal year 22 request was dropped. Um, but then you'll notice on the Secretary of State's office, as the chair mentioned, there's a state match for the federal, the new federal election security funding. Um, and that is a new item. So it's um, reflected in yellow because the federal government just released that. And the estimated state match is $200,000, although um, those numbers have not been finalized. Um, walking down through Department of Administration, um, the two COVID. Uh, items that the chair mentioned are uh, shown in yellow. And again, these are related to worker compensation costs. Um, related to COVID, they're shown in two lines because um, the second line reflects the costs for the bill that and was passed, I think, the first week of session and signed into law for that um, presumption for workers' compensation costs. Um, and please stop me, members, if you have any questions. Um, under minute services, again, uh, the advanced cybersecurity tools that the chair discussed, that is a new item in the revisions yesterday. Um, and then under MMB non-operating is where you'll find the COVID. So that's on lines 50 and 51, or line 50, the um, large amount that the chair mentioned. And there is actually language in the bill in Article 2, Section 11 related to this. Um, however, the, the revisions that came out yesterday changed that number by about um, $9 million, um, it increased to the general fund share of that recommendation from the governor. Um, and then finally, you'll see um, under that, um, again in yellow, St. Paul Teachers Retirement Fund, a one-time COLA for retirees. And at the bottom of the spreadsheet under transfers, the same um, one-time COLA recommendation for MSRS para and TRA. And again, because those were just released yesterday, that the language to implement those provisions is not in the bill before you, but we'll be getting language um, at a later date from the executive branch. Okay, thank you, Ms. Roberts, very helpful. Um, and members, uh, hopefully you were following along on, on the spreadsheet as Ms. Roberts was uh, going through. Uh, calling specific attention to those uh, line items uh, highlighted in yellow. Uh, okay, Chair Nelson. Um, we can go to our testifiers that would be at this point. Yep, yeah, very good. Uh, okay. So first testifier I have is Commissioner Roberts Davis. Please. Introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Are you able to hear me okay? We can. Great. Uh, for the record, I am Alice Roberts Davis, Commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Administration, and I wanted to share some information this morning on the COVID-19 workers' compensation costs related to Chapter 32. Um, I wanted to talk about the uh, costs that we are expecting to incur and that we've already incurred for COVID-19 workers' compensation costs. Uh, in Chapter 32 passed a session that extended the COVID workers' compensation presumption for the period of February 22nd, 2022 through January 14th of 2023. Uh, this request would cover state agency COVID workers' compensation claims costs for that extended period. Admin would pay claims directly for agencies when they meet requirements of the law, and this simplifies claims processing and limits the number of transactions required. Occupations that are covered include licensed peace officers, firefighters, paramedics, uh, or agents or emergency medical technicians, nurses or healthcare providers and workers, assistive employees in healthcare settings, and corrective corrections officers. State agencies with employees covered under the COVID-19 presumption include corrections, human services, natural resources, public safety, and Minnesota's veterans homes. And so the request is for 953,000 in FY22, uh, $1.594 million in FY23, $450,000 FY24, and 200,000 in FY25. 
there are other COVID-19 workers' compensation costs that are anticipated for FY23 of $1 million. And this funding covers costs for COVID-19 workers' compensation claims for the period prior to March 4th, 2021, which currently can't be paid with federal ARP dollars. There are a few cases which admin is still receiving bills for claims that date back to the period before March of 2021. And that's because there are sometimes delays in claim processing before the bill is submitted to admin. And those are usually those long haul cases that are very serious and uh, are longer term cases. And so that um, is the request from the Department of Administration. And I'll stand for any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, any questions? for Commissioner Roberts Davis. Okay, seeing none, our next testifier is Commissioner Tomes. Commissioner, if you would introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, uh, committee. For the record, my name is Tomes and I am Commissioner of Minnesota IT Services and the Chief Information Officer for the state of Minnesota. Just uh, real briefly wanted to address and introduce uh, the change item related to advanced cybersecurity tools. As we have all seen the geopolitical events that are really shaping the world certainly has a tremendous impact on us here in the United States and on each of the states. And our uh, critical need to continue to invest in cyber defenses to make sure that services that are provided to Minnesotans are protected and available in the most highly resilient manners is really, really important. The uh, ask, the change item related to advanced cybersecurity tools really uh, is a uh, component that relates to uh, risk and how we can uh, best address and reduce risk related to these cybersecurity threats, things that can impact uh, really vital services that are provided throughout Minnesota. Uh, it really addresses three broad areas. Uh, it adds a, additional layers of defense to executive branch uh, websites that are externally available, making sure that they're protected against uh, the types of cyber threats that uh, are becoming more and more prevalent uh, to, to disrupt. And certainly we have seen uh, some of the impacts of some of those cyber disruptions worldwide uh, over the course of the last three to four weeks. Uh, there's a, a component of this that is really, really vital that is intended to uh, address the uh, way that our residents in Minnesota authenticate with many of the external facing services and making sure that we have uh, the most uh, sophisticated protections to protect the identities and the uh, the credential component of asset accessing critical systems, things like unemployment insurance systems and things like human uh, services systems, things that are externally facing. And then last, just to continue to build on the investments that have been previously made to uh, enhance our ability to detect and respond to threats that uh, may uh, be uh, that may exist within the executive branch. So our ability to really tool up and as quickly as possible detect those threats and then uh, have a, a sophisticated way of responding. This really builds on uh, a lot of tooling related to detection that we have previously put in place with uh, funding that was provided uh, via the legislative body and, and really is, is vital to continue to invest in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions for Commissioner Tomes? Uh, yes, Representative Bonner. Uh, more of a comment than a question. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Tomes, for, for coming today to talk to us a little bit. And, and I know I just want to underscore to many of my colleagues that, you know, as we continue to see government uh, providing services to really help citizens interact with government, uh, everything from renewing your driver's license uh, to some key services, we really need to be good stewards of making sure that we're protecting the security and the data of our citizens. On top of that, we've seen a marked increases in the recent years of ransomware attacks, denial of service attacks, and they are in fact targeting often many of the entities 
that we hold dear. And that, <clears throat> that includes cities like Atlanta, who had all of their services shut down. With everything happening in the world, we do know there are bad actors, Russia being one of the largest in the world, who has in fact made it quite plain that they have every intention of doing bad things in the world. And so making sure that we secure our defenses from a cybersecurity uh, aspect is really key. And I wanna underscore that for members and how vitally important that really is. I know sometimes uh, this piece of the budget often isn't super exciting. It doesn't look, uh, uh, it's not the, the one that has all the flash and the bang, uh, but the criticality of it is so important that I just want members to really, really take it seriously and understand how vital uh, this piece of the budget is. Thank you for that. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Yes, these are um, definitely challenging times to say the least. Uh, Representative Elkins. Yeah, I'd just like to, you know, as long as we have Mr. Tones here, um, uh, the ERP system stabilization item that's uh, later in the budget, uh, following up on, on Representative Bonner's uh, um, comments, but you know we, we shouldn't have to be asking for a supplemental budget just to allow MMB to keep their systems current. Uh, when we are, are delaying applying the basic patches and upgrades to our you know the, the systems that provide the core uh, core capabilities for managing state government, uh, we should not ever find ourselves in a position where we're in danger of losing support from the software vendor because we're not keeping up with the uh, with the upgrades to the system, and uh, it, it it makes me sad that we you know find ourselves over and over again. Uh, you know, Representative Bonner and I are familiar with another situation like this that's in, in the uh, HHS budget, uh, where one of the uh, you know, one of their arms uh, you know has actually been in danger of being penalized by the federal government for not updating its systems and has already lost incentive payments for not keeping one of their electronic health record systems up, uh, up to date. Um, we need to be keeping up with these basic investments in our core systems. Thank you. Well said, well said, uh, Representative Elkins. Um, further questions for the commissioner? Okay, uh, moving on then. My next testifier is Nicole Freeman. Ms. Freeman, if you would like to introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Sure, thank you. Um, I am just here today to talk about the um, uh, amendment that is forthcoming. Okay. Um, thank you so much. My name is Nicole Freeman, um, Office of Secretary of State. Um, I, uh, the, there is a small change um, that is put in, that will be put into the bill um, in the future, I'm told. Uh, we just got word that a uh, a budget bill was signed um, by the president on Monday um, that was passed by Congress last week. Um, and that bill um, appropriates dollars to the states through the HAVA um, grant funds. And so um, this $200,000 is um, the expected match that we believe we'll have, um, at least with the information we have right now. Um, it's 20% of the million dollars, which uh, will be granted to the state as well. So this $200,000 will go into that HAVA grant account that is here at the state. Um, and then we'll have further legislation to appropriate that to our office. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Freeman. Appreciate the clarification. As uh, Chair uh, Nelson mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, that amendment, I would imagine, will be bringing this back next week. Tuesday likely, so uh, stay tuned and uh, I'm sure um, we'll have a chance to speak more to it then as well. So um, just uh, keep that in mind members that uh, that amend will be men amendment will be forthcoming uh, at a future date. Uh, Representative Kwam, you had a question for Ms. Freeman? Um, th thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is more uh, of, a, of a general, that amendment is coming a lot of detail. There's, there's chalk dust in this, and there's um, a lot of different lo dollars that aren't, we don't see the language and specifics in the bill. So I'm hoping that the chair will give uh, sufficient time to ask the questions when we actually get the language in detail, um, which, is, which is missing at this time. So um, when we, we aren't gonna vote on it today, but when we do actually vote on it, 
I, I hope appropriate time is scheduled. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, Representative Kwam, uh, correct. The bill will be uh, be laid over today. Um, but by all means, if you have questions based on the information before us, uh, uh, please please do uh, pose those questions at this time. We have uh, uh, lots of uh, staff on hand uh, to provide you with answers. So um, if you have a question, please uh, please raise your hand and we will get to you. Uh, Representative Bonner. I wonder if Ms. Freeman could help us a little bit. Um, the Help America Vote funds um, for members who maybe aren't as familiar with that part of the budget. Could you just kind of give us a, a brief sort of an overview of what those uh, funds do and how they help us? Ms. Freeman. Sure. Um, so the Help America Vote Act uh, was passed back in 2002. Um, and since then, um, the federal government has um, allocated funding to states for uh, election administration and security. Um, here in Minnesota, uh, those dollars are put into a grant, um, a HAVA account first, um, and then are appropriated to our office. It's a unique thing here in Minnesota. Um, and so I know we're going to um, have legislation to get those funds released as soon as possible so we can use them this year. Um, we're told that the uh, election ed, um, election administration commission, now I'm saying that's probably wrong, the EAC um, is supposed to uh, distribute the dollars within 45 days of enactment. And so um, we're still hopeful we might be able to use those um, in 2022, um, at least a portion of those grant funds in 2022. Um, they have been used in the past um, to enhance, um, like I said, for um, election administration, um, to enhance our state voter registration system, um, improve election security in other ways. Um, we've used some of the dollars for um, election equipment uh, for counties, cities, and um, local jurisdictions. So there's um, a number of of um, allowances for their use in um, federal law and then also um, in state law sometimes, depending on the appropriation, um, it's been specified further what we can use those dollars for. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Representative Thank Bonner. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ms. Freeman. And, and just one last thing to, to underscore the point, um, in order to tap those dollars, uh, there is, I believe, a state match that is required and that is incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we provide that match in order to get those funds. Is that accurate? Uh, Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Representative. Um, yes, uh, it, we do have a little bit of a timeline to get those grant funds. Um, the state, or the federal legislation did say within two years um, of the appropriation coming to us, uh, but since we're sort of in this supplemental cycle, um, we put in the request now um, to have those grant funds, like I said, ho it, with hopes that we'll be able to um, use them to uh, further beef up um, security and for administration of the 2022 election. Thanks. Okay. Members, I do not have any additional testifiers on uh, my list, but I wanna give it a second. There's a lot of folks on this call. Um, if you would, like to testify, please raise your hand. I got to click through a couple pages here just to make sure I don't miss anybody. Okay. Not seeing any hands raised. Oh, yes. Uh, I have a Mr. Jamie Edwards. No. Okay. No. Yes. All right. Yes, Mr. Edwards, please introduce uh, yes. yourself and proceed with uh, with your statement. Uh, good morning. Yes, Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Jamie Edwards, and I'm the Special Advisor of Intergovernmental Affairs for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. I'm here today to speak in support of the amendment that Chair Nelson spoke of earlier, uh, specific to the, uh, the changes within that amendment to the that are being proposed for the Private Cemeteries Act, uh, Minnesota Statute 307.08. Um, the amendment that, that, that I'm speaking to was crafted in collaboration with the Department of Admin and the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. Uh, the issue that is being addressed in the proposed 
amendment that is the of the utmost importance to the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe is aligning state law with federal law, specifically when it comes to American Indian burials and objects of cultural significance that may be unearthed when lands are disturbed due to new home construction, highway projects, the establishment of new utility lines and many other activities that may require digging into the ground. Uh, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act was passed by Congress in, on November 16th of 1990 to resolve the disposition of Native American remains and cultural items under the control of federal agencies and institutions that receive federal funding, as well as the ownership or control of human remains and other cultural items discovered on federal or tribal lands. Uh, items of cultural significance were unearthed at an exca excavation site on the Mille Lacs Indian Reservation near Wigwam Bay back in November of 2021. And those items were removed from the area um, under the direction of the state archaeologist. And those items were sent out of state um, to be analyzed by an outside archaeological firm. Um, but that was done without consent of the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. And under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, 25 U.S. Code, Section 3002, it identifies ownership or control of Native American cultural items that are excavated or discovered on tribal lands after the passage of, of NAGPRA shall be the Indian tribe whose tribal lands such objects or remains were discovered. Um, customs and ceremonies in our community, including funeral and burial traditions, are of the utmost importance to the Anishinaabe of Mille Lacs. We are asking for support of this amendment today to ensure the ancestral remains of our people and, our, and or items of cultural significance that may be unearthed when land is disturbed within the exterior boundaries of a reservation. The rightful ownership of those items should be the tribe whose lands the items were discovered on pursuant to federal law. These proposed changes to state law will help clarify roles and responsibilities between tribes, the Office of State Archaeology, and the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council when it comes to American Indian burials. Thank you, Miigwech, um, for the opportunity to testify on this very important issue today. And thank you, Mr. Mr. Edwards. Uh, appreciate your testimony today. Um, uh, I'm hoping that you'll be able to join us uh, when that amendment does come back before the committee uh, to make yourself available for any questions that may come up when we vote on that. So, uh, but thank you for your testimony today. And um, uh, we, uh, as the Chair Nelson mentioned, we'll be uh, bringing that uh, amendments back to the committee, uh, hopefully next week. Okay, uh, that is it for testifiers. Member questions. Give folks a second here. Make sure I don't miss anybody. All right. Well, uh, with that, Chair Nelson, uh, any closing comments with regards to House File 4125? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And again, this is this is the governor's proposed budget. There has been some changes to it that will be coming in an amendment, the uh, partial amendment that I have now that I've explained talked about is the a1 amendment that is basically um, the biggest part of it is it has to do with the cemeteries and the cemetery act private cemetery act um so there member with that members if there are no more questions um we can move on we'll lay this on the table hopefully and we can move on from there and, and we'll have an um probably a more full discussion of this when we bring it up for passage thank you chair nelson and representative nash i see you got your hand up thank you mr chair yes i do um, to Chair Nelson, obviously this is the governor's request and for uh, you all there is some urgency, but speaking from my side, I would hope that you post the amendment in sufficient time that it can be digested uh, so that we don't have to have it posted on a, say, Monday afternoon for a Tuesday committee. It's really not fair to members to do that that quickly. Can you tell us what your intentions in that regard are? Uh, Chair Nelson. Mr. Mr. Chair and Representative Nash, my intentions are as, as soon as I I get the all the all of the amendment, the things that have been discussed uh, that by the different commissioners that aren't in the bill currently but are on the spreadsheet. As soon as I get it, I want to get it posted, 
and hopefully we will give have enough time to have have it digested and have questions asked and all those fun things that we do in committee. Okay, thank you, Chair Nelson. Uh, all right, seeing no further questions with that, House File 4125 is laid over. Uh, Chair Nelson, back to you. I see Representative Skowski had his hand up for a second there. Oh. Uh, uh, and he took it down, just, but um, if there are no further questions on the House File 4125, um, We'll move to our next bill, Representative Hansen, um, House File 3845. And I'll move House File 3845 to be referred to the Committee on Human Services. Um, fiscal note is not done on that yet, but and uh, but it that's the cost of our for, for human services to take care of. So Representative Hansen, you want to ex um, explain your bill? Representative Hansen. I'm not sure if I see her on oh. there. Sorry about that. My mute button was not working. I see. We can there hear you we now. We can hear you now and see you now. There. Great. Well, thank you for having me, Mr. Chair and committee members. I am excited to present this bill to you. House File 3845 seeks to create an office of a youth foster ombudsperson. You know, children in foster fit care face critically important issues and they deserve to be served and protected like all of the other children in our state. Youth in foster care do not always have a resource or avenue for intervention when they face abuse or neglect at the hands of our very own child protection systems. Navigating the foster care system alone is a challenging task. And without the appropriate tools and advocates, we will continue to allow the common cycles of hurt and trauma that we are seeing in our communities today. As some of you might know, I've presented other bills about some of the existing challenges in our child welfare system. And in this space and for this bill, I think just some of the following information that I'll share with you is probably relevant to you about why we need to focus on this and why this is such an important issue. In Minnesota in 2020, American Indian and Indigenous children were 16.4 times more likely than white children to be removed from their homes. African American and Black children were 2.4 times more likely to be removed from their homes than white children. And children of two or more races were 6.8 times more likely to experience out of home placement than white children. The disparities for Indigenous kids and families are some of the worst in the nation, and some of us see too many similarities between today's child protection system and boarding schools of the past. This system is riddled by bias that we are working to address through other bills, and this office is another tool for the toolbox in this initiative. This office aims to provide oversight for the systems that are tasked with protecting Minnesota's children from harm and to create a pathway to adequately track the issues affecting young people in foster care today. As it stands, there are no organizations or entities that track complaints or common concerns that arise for youth in foster care. And without this data, we are left without the critically important information that we need and that we value to inform the necessary changes we need to make. While we of course have some data that gives us glimpses, into the system's overall efficacy and the, de the, the, the deficits as well. The lack of more data means that we are also lacking the ability to make more data-informed decisions as we work to protect kids and implement the meaningful changes they need. Establishing this office will promote equity and equal opportunity for more of the foster population. Although this will not address all of the needs of foster youth in foster care. This office will make sure that more youth in foster care will have more access to critical resources, that they'll have an advocate to help them resolve issues, and it will give more visibility to the need for change as called for by this community. Members, by establishing an office uh, ombudsperson for foster youth, we're creating an organizational structure that will create positive change. It will allow for more capacity to do independent investigations and track areas where significant intervention is needed. 
This office will positively affect the Minnesota child welfare system by increasingly addressing the intersecting issues youth often face in foster care, like housing and homelessness, substance use, abuse, and more. And with that, Mr. Chair, I will turn it over to our testifiers. Thank you, Representative Hansen. Um, I, I have a list of testifiers here. First one is Shauna Fairbanks. Ms. Fairbanks, you want to introduce yourself for the tape and then proceed. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for giving me the chance to speak before you today. My name is Shauna Bowen Fairbanks and I am 19 years old. I was born in Bemidji, Minnesota and have lived here for most of my life. I'm getting ready to go to college in the fall to study social work and psychology and continue my advocacy work. But until school starts, I'm enjoying this extra time getting lost in my art. I officially entered foster care when I was eight years old, but I should have entered much sooner. My mom has struggled with addiction for as long as I can remember. She would get in trouble with the law a lot, so my sister and I were moving around with her or waiting for her to be released. I know it's not easy being a single mom, so I like to believe that my mom was doing the best she could, but to be honest, she was never really there. The instability that came as a result of my mom's run-ins with the law was difficult for me. I still remember when the police arrested my mom and they didn't know that my sister and I were in the house. I was 10 and my sister was eight. I did the best I could to keep her safe. We were alone for two weeks before my auntie came looking for us. I wish I could tell you that this pattern ended, but that is not the case in my story. Over the years, I have transitioned to so many different placements. I can't even tell you the number. I've lived with family, in foster homes, group homes, shelters, treatment centers, and detention centers. I've been homeless. I've seen it all. I experienced my breaking point at age 13 when they separated me from my little sister, my rock, my only stability through this. We were not able to see each other for two years. I begged to see her, but it never happened. I felt like I had no one to turn to when this was happening. Eventually, I was placed in a detention center. I guess it was because there was nowhere else for me to go. I remember wondering why I was there. I hadn't done anything wrong, but the staff there treated me like a criminal. I remember being brought over to, to my hearing for my child protective case, and they made me wear shackles. I hated the shackles. I didn't belong there. That month felt like an eternity. Fortunately, my social worker moved me to St. Cloud Children's Home. I stayed there until it was officially closed. I have a lot of mixed feelings about this place, but weirdly, it was the first place that ever felt like home to me. When I was almost 15, I was able to move in with my older sister. She was only 20 years old. I was so excited because I was also able to see my little sister again. I remember feeling complete and whole after I was reunited with her. Just before I turned 18, my mom officially signed over her rights to my oldest sister. Looking back, there are days I wish I she would have tried harder. In other days, I wish someone would have intervened earlier. I look back and wonder, did it really have to be this way? I support this bill because children in foster care have no choice but to rely on the state. But we know that fosters like me are facing further harm while in care. Who can we call if it's the state who is causing harm? No one. There are many times that I wanted to tell someone how unsafe I felt or how scared I was. Adults always tell us, fosters, that if something ever goes wrong, to go tell your social worker. But every time I tried, no one ever came to my rescue. We have the opportunity to do better for fosters. I know that creating an ombudsman for foster youth would do just that. Please vote in support of Bill HF 3845. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowen Fairbanks. Uh, the next person I have on my list is Isabella Wagner. And I hope I said that properly, Ms. Wagner. Chair and members of the committee, Thank you for giving me the chance to speak before you today. My name is Isabella Wagner and I am 19 years old. My experience in foster care is compelling me to graduate college, but even more importantly, it is motivating me to be the social worker I needed so many times in my life. Right now, I am a student at the University of Northwestern St. Paul, where I am double majoring in politics, history, economics, and English lit. I spend a lot of time in Dassel, Minnesota with my amazing grandparents. I don't know where I would be without them. Whenever the smell of a campfire catches me, it always brings me back to them. They are the only home and stability I have ever known. You're probably wondering, what changed? When I was six months old, I was placed with my grandparents, so I always believed they were my parents. 
My dad has his demons and really stayed in one place, but since he was my father, that meant I was along for the ride. I remember around six years old, my dad came and picked me up from school. Suddenly, I was living with him and my whole world changed. I remember wondering what happened to my parents, aka grandparents. I went from a loving and supportive world to an entirely different one. I suddenly had siblings, and for the very first time, I felt betrayed. My dad and stepmom moved around a lot, and any meaningful connections I made were quickly broken. I was thankful for my four siblings because they made things easier, simpler. We all experienced a lot of disruptions. When I look back at it, I'm amazed I even graduated high school, not to mention I'm a college student. When I was 15, my social worker decided to place me out of the home and I was able to go to my grandparents because there was nowhere else for me to go. It had almost been a decade since I last saw them. I remember finally feeling like a normal teenager for the first time. I wonder why did I ever have to leave them? A lot of damage was done in those 10 years. I miss my siblings so much and I worry about them often. I would always ask if I could talk to them on the phone or see them. The answer was always no, but you can see your dad anytime. Or if you see your dad, maybe you can see your siblings. I felt so stuck. No one was listening to me. I gave up. My grandparents fought hard for me to have visitation with my siblings as well, but with no success. I was never able to say goodbye. I know this separation has affected me. I still wonder how it affected my younger siblings to this day. I support this bill because I don't want anyone to experience what I have been through. There are many instances where I wish I had someone to call, but for me, having maintained a connection with my siblings would have made all the difference. As I get older, I am still putting the pieces together. I still wonder what it would be like to call my sister for advice or to call my brother to wish him a happy birthday. I also wish they knew they could call me on the good days and the bad ones as well. I would love to finally have closure. The creation of an ombudsman for foster youth will be the lifeline that so many Minnesota fosters need. I know they would have helped me. Will you support me in passing HF 3845? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. The next person we have on the list is Ada Smith. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak before you today. My name is Ada Smith. I am 23 years old. I currently live in Circle Pines with my two children who are two and six. I'm looking forward to the day I am able to build the perfect home for my family in a town like Circle Pines. I own a small clothing business in Blaine, but in my spare time, I am, I am focused on fosters like me. I entered the foster care at the age of 15, although it should have been sooner. At the age of 13, my mother passed away and things were never the same. I was alone and raising myself the best I could. I sought out for resources to get my needs met and I worked toward emancipation. This is how I originally came in contact with Hennepin County. At the time, I truly felt I was tricked into foster care. They placed me at St. Joe's Home for Children for one year. It felt like I was in prison and I felt so alone. There was no one looking out for me and no one that was going to save me from this. At 16 years old, I became pregnant with my first child. This was the biggest blessing in my life and also the scariest moment of my life. After my son was born, everything was much more complicated. We moved around a lot because the counties never had a safe place for us. My social worker was amazing and I know he did the best he could with what was available. But the foster homes I stayed in were awful. I wasn't receiving the support I needed and I was never taught how to care for him. I wanted so badly to be a good mom, I would try to make sure my child wouldn't cry at night because we would get yelled at if my foster parents heard him crying. I remember having to beg for diapers, clothes, and formula constantly, and it just continued to get worse from there. The living conditions weren't safe, and after pleading for help, I was told I was going to be separated from my son. I was so scared, and no one believed me, so I ran away. I didn't have any family in Minnesota. With no support, I ended up creating my own living situations for a short time. That didn't last long because I was without resources. When I was finally able to talk with my social worker again, they told me they didn't have any placements for us to stay together. He gave me a choice. We could either move to Texas and live with my sister or I could have, or I would have to return to St. Joe's home for children and I'll be separated from my son. I was never gonna leave my child alone. I chose to move across the country to Texas. 
Well, as you can see, we survive. However, these experiences will never leave me. A few years ago, I learned about the role of an ombudsman while at a foster care conference in Louisiana. I will never forget this moment. Throughout my five years in foster care, I've always prayed for a lifeline, and I still wonder what it would have been like if I had someone fighting for my safety and stability for my son. I support this bill, and I don't want anyone to experience what I've been through. Technically, the state is our parents, and every child needs a village. The creation of an ombudsman for foster youth is a huge step in the right direction. We need to do better, and this is the change I want to be a part of. Please vote to end support of HF 3845. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, you are muted. Sorry about that. I've got some work going on outside my house. Uh, I turned it off. Mr. Murphy, uh, this is my last person on my testifiers list. You want to say your name for the tape and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Nelson and members of the, of the committee. My name is Juan Murphy, and I'm the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called Foster Advocates. It's not just our name. It's what we do. Uh, we foster advocacy with young people who have been impacted by foster care. You've just heard from some of our wonderful young people. I founded this work uh, in 2018 because uh, when I was in foster care, I thought my experience was uniquely bad. What I was horrified to see um, nearly 10 years after aging out of care is that that's not true. Uh, I was lucky. I was lucky because I'm in a position to talk to you about that experience now. And while I deeply wish that I could just tell you all how great we are doing as a state and as parents to all of our foster youth, the 13,000 that are in our care, I'm sorry to inform you, but we are not, not by any reasonable measure of success. Upon reaching their 21st birthday, at a time most of our peers are celebrating, uh, fosters face a deep stability cliff as they lose financial and social support networks provided by the state. So then it's no wonder that within a year of aging out, often at 18 years old, 25 to 40% of fosters experience homelessness, with half to two thirds experiencing homelessness with the first four years of aging out. In fact, experience in foster care is one of the most predictable factors to being homeless later in life. A recent survey of fosters aged 18 through 21 found that 79% had experienced homelessness here in the Twin Cities. So when families are not good places or not safe places for children to be, the government intervenes. Who intervenes when it is the government that is causing the harm? It begs just a really basic question. Who is watching the watchers? Currently, I would argue no one. Children are entrusted to our care and they must face the challenges of life on their own upon aging out. But they shouldn't have to face the foster care system alone with no one, to, no one to help and no one to call. And it doesn't have to be this way. We can do better for our young people. We must do better. Creating more opportunity for the Ombuds Office to create meaningful change and improve systemic issues plaguing the child welfare system will have a trickle down effect for the state child welfare systems by anticipating and fixing issues that otherwise may lead to the endangerment of foster youth, as you heard this morning. Creating a advisory board for this office will allow youth and advocates like the young people that you've heard uh, to share the lived experiences um, and have a voice in the system. This increased oversight uh, from this advisory board will also help the office better define its objectives and evaluate its impact. Make no mistake, these are our children. They became ours when we separated them from their families. And we owe them a duty of care just as strongly as we do for the children in our own homes. And the fundamental truth is that children are children and they should have the, an expectation that adults will take care of them. But I've repeatedly seen at the personal level and now at the systems level that this is not happening. So it is my, it is my sincerest hope that those of you who are in power or in a position to reflect are in a position to make change, reflect deeply on our moral responsibility and the cost of our continued indifference. Please support the creation of an Office of the Ombudsperson for Fosters. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Um, I have a couple of hands up for questions. Representative Claiborne. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members and Representative Hansen. Thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, sure. To our fosters who have testified today, I just wanna thank you for the bravery and courage to share your own stories. Uh, the um, trauma that you experienced is real and I just wanna acknowledge that in this public space. I have previously served as a guardian ad litem for children in need of protection. And uh, it was one of the major reasons that I ran for the legislature. I saw their services being cut. I saw that we did not have proper placement for children who needed supports in their foster homes. And I also saw the dedication of the, uh, the staff who were trying to provide the right services for our children. And the problem is, you know, we all accept responsibility for the inadequacies of the system. It's not just the juvenile protection system that um, fails our children, but it was also the legislature that failed our children by not funding these programs appropriately. Uh, the children that I served were beautiful, bright, lovely children who were in harm's way. They were not. And as we heard in the story today, one of my children um, definitely parentified caring for her younger brother and kept her younger brother alive for the first two years of his life. Um, it, it, it just about killed me when we separated the children because there were no beds available for these children to be together. Um, the struggles that I had in trying to get uh, a sibling visitation were unbelievable. These systems must must change and rep hands on your bill go forward to do that. I would like to see if we can adding uh, guardian ad litem voices to this uh, to this committee as well, because the guardians are often the people who are not paid who go in and try to advocate for the needs of the children. Um, so uh, I just want to thank you again for bringing this bill forward. Children are children, and they are our responsibility. And it is the parent, uh, it is the state as the parent who needs to make sure that we are taking care of them in that capacity as we would take care of our own children in our own homes. So thank you for bringing this bill forward. Uh, there is much, much work to be done in the system. But I do also want to say there are dedicated social workers, there are dedicated uh, child advocates out there who are doing their very best. They are overworked, their hours are long, and we as a whole are failing our children. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Claiborne. Representative Greenman. Uh, uh, thank you, Ms. We're running short on time here, so if you can keep your questions and comments short, we've got other people that will have questions and we have another bill to get to. Representative Greenman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Representative Hansen, for bringing this bill. I just wanted to echo to Ms. Uh, Bullen Fairbanks, to Ms. We uh, Wagner, to Ms. Smith, and to Mr. Uh, Murphy how important it is to hear your stories. It feels like one of the reasons we need this bill is that the voices of our uh, kids and young folks are missing from how we are creating this policy and, and how the system is working. And so I, I just, I know how uh, courageous and vulnerable um, um, you have to be to come into the space uh, and just really one want to appreciate that and also uh, let you know that we are listening and to uh, to I think what Mr. Murphy said so well we can and we must do better and so I, I really appreciate all of your advocacy Representative Hanson I know this is an issue that is close to you and you've been really championing um, and I'm looking forward to voting for this bill and I'm looking forward to hearing more of your voices um, as we make policy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Representative Kwong, you have a question or a comment? Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm trying to get some uh, clarification. I, a few years ago, I had a constituent, her and her wife have several foster uh, children and the ombudspersons uh, at that time only covered specific uh, populations. And while some of their foster children were um, from these uh, specific groups, 
Um, one wasn't, and they had nowhere to go to, to uh, uh, when they had an issue with, with the county social workers. The only uh, person they could go back to were the same people that they were having issues with. How does this bill change or interact with the current uh, um, ombudspersons uh, covering this area? Uh, Represent Hansen. Do you want to answer that or do you want one of your testifiers? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Kwam. I believe in uplifting and amplifying the voices of community, and I think Kwam would answer this way better than I can. Mr. Murphy. Uh, maybe not better, but I'm willing to answer it nonetheless. I uh, really appreciate the question. Uh, this office is specifically to serve foster youth. Uh, it does not, uh, it's not looking to address uh, any um, racially specific service the way that the other ombudspersons for families are. Uh, in fact, when speaking with those ombudspersons, uh, they, some of them felt it would be a conflict of interest to serve children who are in foster care because that those ombudspersons are serving families that feel like they had a uh, process violation when entering uh, the child welfare system. So before foster care, uh, this one would serve all foster youth across the state. Representative Kwam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, my understanding from that response is that we would still have the gap of where the current ombuds persons only cover certain uh, portions. And so there's still a gap of anyone that doesn't fall into those groups. Um, so I, I would hope the bill as it moves can now include this component, but not leave the, the blaring gap that uh, uh, the other on Boots people first ask uh, about ethnicity um, before they, they assist. And, and there's a portion of the population that is left out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Kwam for your question. Uh, Representative Mason, you have your hand up. And I think Representative Kwam probably went into the area that I was looking at. And first of all, to our testifiers, I'm so sorry and I truly appreciate you will your willingness to come here and testify. We obviously have a long way to go. I guess my question is, you know, we've got social workers, we've got the guardians on, on Lydum. And so is it that those particular people are not able to do the job and this will be in addition to, or will the, the uh, foster, will this bill, will the children now be put under this group and separated from the other programs. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Mason, for the question. The best team in the social services arena is an interdisciplinary one. It's one that crosses into multiple areas. At no point in time, as somebody who's from the social work field, will I ever say that the social workers who are out there aren't doing their absolute best. But to Representative Cleborn's point earlier, there have been multiple failures at multiple points along the way in the systems that have developed to address children's welfare, whether it be at the legislature or other places, um, that have created a lot of uh, compounding issues that leave voices out. And so this office will add an additional advocate, an additional pathway, an additional option to continue to bulk out the full services that this population needs and deserves to honor their agency, to honor their dignity and their worth, and to make sure that we address their needs. Now, I will also say, vast underinvestment in social workers throughout the state has consequences. And these are some of the things, when we have people who have caseloads that are too high, when there are issues where um, there just aren't enough places for folks to go, like I mentioned in my opening comments, this is not the uh, uh, golden solution by any means. I have several other bills that are addressing a lot of the gaps in this, um, in this area, 
But this helps having a point of contact, having somebody who tracks the data, having somebody who watches, as Mr. Murphy said, somebody who's watching the watchers helps. And again, I just go back to the best model is an interdisciplinary one. Thank, Thank you, Representative Hansen. Thank you. Seeing no further hands, um, I'll renew my motion that House File 3845 be referred to the Committee on Human Services. And Mr. Brinks, can you please take the roll? Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. Aye. Nash votes aye. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Dreskowski. No. Dreskowski votes nay. Representative Elkins. Elkins votes aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman votes aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley. Aye. New Brindley votes aye. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Kwam. Aye. Kwam votes aye. Representative Kosnick. Chair, with a vote of 11 ayes, one nay, and one um, excused, abstained, excused uh, the motion prevails. The motion prevails. The bill's on its way to the Committee on Human Services. Thank you, Representative Hansen. The next person we have, Bill, we have on our list is Representative Lee, um, House File 3780. And I will move House File 3780 to be referred to the Capital Investors, Investments Committee. And Representative Lee, I see you have an A1 amendment. Do we want me to put that on before you discuss the bill? Uh, yes, please, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Lee, I'll move the A1 amendment um, if you want to briefly describe what the amendment does. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. So the A1 amendment uh, adds a staffing requirement to the appropriation and requires that staff provide technical assistance and expertise on uh, capital budgeting and to be available for uh, help to nonprofits and projects that are exempted from the state pre-design requirements throughout the entire design process for the projects. Um, members, if you want to unmute, um, all in favor of uh, putting uh, the A1 amendment and putting the bill in the method that are the, the way that the author wants, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, the bill's amended. Uh, Representative Lee, um, you want to briefly describe what your the, your bill does or did, they, did you do, did you, uh, describe, just did your description of the amendment cover that? Representative uh, Lee. Mr. Chair, I'll uh, briefly describe this. So this is a bill to help nonprofits and projects that are uh, small, that are exempted from the state pre-design requirements throughout the capital budgeting process. Uh, it is to increase the capacity of MMB to proactively raise awareness about our capital budget and also to provide technical assistance to them. And it's also to help provide for MMB to have the capacity to coordinate with other state agencies that may have other capital related appropriations, Mr. Chair. Uh, to keep it short, I'll leave it there. I know there's some testifiers here and I'll stand for questions afterwards. And member and uh, testifiers, if you can. Keep your testimony as short as possible so we can get time for questions. We're running, we're getting close to our our, uh, our adjournment time. So Mr. Jimenez, first, no, first person on my list is Ms. Ann Voda. And if you wanna uh, uh, now, um, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair Nelson and members of the committee. My name is Ann Voda and I'm president of Benz Thompson Mito Architects, a woman owned architecture firm. We've been serving Minnesota state agencies and other public entities and community nonprofits for over 50 years. I'm here on behalf of the American Institute of Architects, Minnesota, which represents more than 2,200 architecture and design professionals around the state. We'd like to voice our support for House File 3780, which provides resources for the state to do outreach and provide assistance to entities seeking to access the capital budgeting process. 
as it stands now, we have a group of practitioners and agencies and other publicly funded entities that are well versed in the bonding process and they can do it efficiently and consistently. Um, however, if we want to expand that core group to include a wider variety of entities from cities and counties who don't often do bonded projects to developers and design professionals that just need better guidance, we need to provide more resources to support their success. Um, we also know that nonprofits, developers, and design professionals from BIPOC and Native communities may not have the same exposure to those bond funding requirements, and um, or, or similar to a, a larger client like University of Minnesota. Um, so to make access more equitable for all, more resources are needed. I'm told that the fiscal note for this bill directly states an emphasis for support of these communities, uh, which we agree is extremely important. AIA Minnesota believes providing MMB with resources so their staff can rise to meet this challenge is a good use of the modest funds requested. Um, one area that can present a particular challenge to projects and practitioners not experienced with the bonding process is meeting the B3 Sustainable Buildings um, SB 2030 standard, uh, which is required for funding. This standard is critical to ensure that buildings constructed with state dollars will be efficient and resilient and maximize their useful lifespan. Um, however, for design practitioners, developers, and other entities that don't regularly engage with this process, it can appear uh, daunting at first. The, um, uh, it, ensuring that there are capital budget staff with knowledge in areas like this um, SB 2030 compliance will help head off um, the kinds of problems that eventually cost a project more money and more time. So we believe that by expanding the pool of empowered clients and designers, um, they'll make the budgets requested for bonding projects more accurate, and it will reduce the number of supplemental requests that will be required and make the process more efficient. We hope you'll support this bill today so that we can continue uh, improving the bonding process for all Minnesotans. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Voda. Uh, the next person on my list is Mr. Jimenez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Enrique Jimenez, the Executive Director of the Latino Economic Development Center. I'm here in support of House File 3780. LDC is a community development financial institution that provides micro lending to Latino entrepreneurs start their business or expand their business. We also help first time farmers acquire their first farm. As our community continues to grow, so is the demand for our services. We have recently seen an influx of investment from federal government and philanthropy to support Latino and other emerging communities build generational wealth. We are doing just that, helping our clients build generational wealth through the acquisition of farmland, lots or buildings that they have worked on for years. Nevertheless, this process can be difficult and costly, not just for our clients, but as a nonprofit, let alone go through a capital investment process uh, through the state. It has taken me years to be able to understand the process, and I'm still asking for technical assistance and expertise from state government staff. <clears throat> LADC, you want to wrap up, Mr. Jimenez, so we can get to questions? Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm done. I'm in support. Okay. Thank you, Anam. Um, quick members, questions of the bill. Questions of the bill. Representative Nash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Could uh, we have an understanding of the fiscal implication of this? Um, Ms. Roberts, do you want to, can you walk us through the fiscal note? Um, Mr. Chair, members, Helen Roberts from the House Fiscal Staff. Um, there is staff here from MMB that can go into more detail, but the fiscal note um, estimates that they will need three new FTE to do this work. Um, it would be two new FTE in the debt management division, one for expanded capital budget capacity, and one for compliance requirements and expertise, and then one in the budget division for expanded capital budget capacity. So that is a total of $464,000 per year. Representative Nash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That just, uh, I, I wanted to make sure we got that out there that we're going to spend uh, just a little under a half a million dollars to assist in spending bonding money a little bit better. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Nash. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? 
and wait here one more second. Uh, Representative Kosnick. Thanks, just to further clarify to the author, uh, the need for this bill, uh, why isn't there current representation or people within the uh, bonding area that are available to uh, help people that, that want to use the bonding process? We don't, um, so, so, so essentially we, we don't have people helping right now? Representative Lee, and maybe somebody, from the person from the administration, Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question, Representative Kosnick. So we, we do have staff over at MMB right now that does help generally with uh, projects like this. But, you know, we are seeing from this past year and, you know, the previous year as we go through our tours and, you know, some of these uh, projects submission to the state, you know, they are getting help at different stages. And so what we're trying to do here is that in order for us to be really a good stewards of the, of the public dollars as we consider these projects, we should embed these staff over at the very beginning so that they're not just helping out with nonprofits, but also some of these small projects from smaller towns throughout the, the state that doesn't have the technical capacity to really, you know, sit down and work with somebody from the start to end. And I think that, you know, for us, uh, you know, as we evaluate projects, we want to make sure that the request that's coming to us are actually the, the right amount. And I think this gets back to my testifier and her, uh, you know, testimony saying that, you know, without this, we have folks out there, you know, who may have general knowledge about the cap capital budgeting process, but not fully understand some of the compliance and requirements. And, you know, when they come to us, uh, you know, we might not have the most accurate um, request amount. And so I think this is why, you know, we need to add additional staff over there. And, you know, I think to uh, the previous uh, point that uh, Representative Nash brought up, you know, right now, even in the governor's budget uh, requests for all the different uh, agencies, they are putting in administrative costs through that side too. And so do we want to fund one time, you know, administrative costs for each agency, or do we want to focus then on uh, providing uh, staffing over at MMB to help provide the technical expertise for all agencies and, you know, for folks that are coming to the state for uh, capital requests. Representative Kosnick. No, thank you. And Representative Lee, I, I appreciate your efforts and uh, your strong work on, on the bonding, pro, uh, bonding committee. Uh, I'm not sure that this bill adding more FTEs is the exact way to go, but I understand uh, your intent on this. Um, but adding more FTEs at, at this time I, is a concern for me and actually how it would be implemented. But I thank you for your clarification on the intent and why we're doing, why you're asking for this. But um, I think it needs a little bit more work, but uh, thank you for that. Any further questions? If not, I'll renew my motion that House File 3780 be referred to the Capital Investments Committee uh, as amended. Be referred to the Capital Investments Committee. And with that, Mr. Brinks, can you take the roll? Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. No. Nash votes nay. Representative Bonner. Representative you're muted. Just Representative Bonner, you're muted. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Joskowski. No. Joskowski votes nay. Representative Elkins. It's aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman votes aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleveland votes aye. Representative Kosnick. Nay. Kosnick votes nay. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley. No. New Brindley votes nay. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Quam. No. Quam votes nay. Chair with a vote of eight ayes and five nays. The motion prevails. The motion prevails. The bill's on its way to capital investments. And members, we're Coming up to the end here, um, next Tuesday's meeting, uh, one, the stadium bill was removed is that we don't have the amendment that we need to put on there yet, but we have three bills on the agenda. There might be more added, um, so keep, keep apprised of that. And uh, members with that, um, we are adjourned.